So hello. You're probably wondering when we're talking about the revolution in the world of work, where there, why there is Michael Jackson on this slide. I would like you to think back the time when you were six years old. And I will tell a story from when I was six years old. And it was an important, I have a very vivid memory from that age because it was the, I got my very first album. It was the, exactly the same album, Michael Jackson Thriller. And not only was important the musical aspect of it, but also the fact that this was, was my first understanding that there is diversity in the world, that there are people of other color, other races, different from the blue-eyed, uh, blonde-haired people I had seen in the neighborhood. Because, you see, not only didn't people travel less back then, but my background, my childhood, was in a society, I grew up basically behind a very thick wall. In, a, in an environment where my country was occupied by Soviet Union and basically we had no connection with the outside world, which meant we saw only what was the surrounding. We knew only what was the surrounding. And now you probably ask, so how did you get that Michael Jackson thriller if there was no connection with the outside world? Well, here comes my grandmother. My grandmother, despite of all the limitations in the country, she managed to first somehow meet a Swedish sailor and then marry him and then escape the Soviet Union and go and live in Sweden. And when she was finally allowed to come and visit the country, she smuggled in Michael Jackson's thriller. So I learned about diversity through that album and believe me, before I spoke English, I knew every lyric from that album. But years later, um, when our country had gained our independence and we, we were again allowed to dream, I had a dream and I, this curiosity that had started from this Michael Jackson thriller, I wanted to learn more about other cultures, about other countries. And I managed to find scholarship and do an exchange student year in the United States. And I remember a moment where I was about half, a, half away to my exchange year, when I was sitting in this beautiful little cafe, breaking new grounds. And I was thinking, if just looking at the change in my own views, in the way I had seen the world before I had arrived to, through that experience, I thought, if everybody on the planet could do this, I think we would have a much better world. But it wasn't only me, not only uh, me who was thinking something along the lines. Another person who might be more familiar to you, Baruto Gaito, he had around the same time a similar dream, but his dream was to move to Japan. And I asked, before I came on the stage here, I asked Baruto, he's also from Estonia, I asked Baruto, what was, what inspired you to take the journey and what this changed in your life? And his answer was, as you see, it was my youth that inspired to move to Japan. It was a courageous step motivated by this young age, but it changed the whole life. And he said that thanks to the decision I made back then, I am today who I am. But we, with Paruta, we were kind of extraordinary explorers that time, because just to take you back, what is the time that we're talking about? That was the time when mixtapes were still around, they were not in museums. And that was the time when there was a recipe for success. And when you followed that recipe, when you got the right education, went to the right location, you put all that together, you had a success. Whether you liked your job or not, it was a very safe recipe. But what has changed since then? Just recently, a CEO, a media a CEO who has been working as a CEO in media business in Europe for over 15 years, he told me, you know, 10 years ago, when I had a young candidate coming to my office and I told him or her that in five years, you know, you're starting from here, 
in five years you could be up there climbing the stairs and you saw the inspiration, the willingness to join. Whereas today, when I look at the candidate and say that in five years you can still work with us, then they run to the door because their way of seeing work is very different. So why do candidates look at the door and they didn't look at the door 10 years ago? When you look at the global trends or things that have actually happened within the past 10 years, then one of the big changes that happened was that, in a way, the, the recipe was broken. The myth to job security was busted because there were millions and millions of people who followed the recipe, who had done the education, the safe corporate job, the job that was guaranteed to bring a very safe life, but they still lost. So from there, raise the question, if I could lose a job anyway, then why not make a difference? And that's interesting that just that uh, Accenture made last summer a survey on the US college graduates and uh, number one most important thing that 92% of the students answered to a question. The question was, what is the most important thing when choosing your first job? And remember, first job, with all the loans that you have from school, with no experience that you have to show on your resume, 92% said the most important thing is to make a difference, that whatever I'm going to work on has to make a difference. So in a way, we are entering an era where we have a workforce, a very entrepreneurial workforce, who's willing to, to help us build our visions, to willing to take risks. And not only that, if you look at that workforce no, more closely, what has changed within the past 10 years? Then the comfort zone of the people has expanded globally. Because 10 years ago, even when I went to uh, America, it was Estonian going to America or German going to somewhere else. We were very, we we're living our local life and we were sometimes visiting other places. Whereas with the networks, what has changed is that suddenly my friends, I have a friend who is in Japan or in Australia or India or America, who's much more my person than anybody in my neighborhood. So suddenly we are comfortable being anywhere. And just like that uh, Wall Street Journal just recently said that the high-skilled members of the next generation appear to be less tied to a particular location or national identity. So if you can live anywhere, you're comfortable to live anywhere, what becomes important? The user experience of a country. So suddenly, one of the big things that has to change is the way countries think. The way countries used to think is that I, as a country, I decide I have this community of people around me, and I control this community of people, and this is my playground. When suddenly, people are moving around, which means that the user experience of a country, so the country where it is good to live, the country where you don't, where you're not, um, humiliated in the immigration interviews, or the country where you feel good about educating your kids, or the country where you just save time from bureaucracy. That becomes important. And now thinking about what's happening in the world, I, the big question ha arises, who would want to move behind a wall? 10 years ago, um, I was the CEO of MTV, and now if you're thinking how old is this woman, then I was just very young CEO of MTV in Estonia. I was 23 year old, the youngest CEO of MTV in the world. And one of the things that I, I started when, when I have now observed past two years when building my uh, startup Jobatical, then the talent mobility, one of the things I have observed is there's some similarity to the trends what happened in the music industry. So one of the big changes, so when I started with 
as the CEO of MTV, it was very exciting to work with this big brand. But people didn't want to really watch MTV any anymore. And it was very difficult. It had become very difficult to design the programming. And why was that? The change that happened in the music industry was the fact that MP3 format came out. So which meant that when before there were mainstream artists, artists that only were you could be a star through the labels. Then suddenly with MP3 format, anybody could record any music in their living room. And suddenly what happened with that in the music industry is that people had so many different tastes. They didn't want to listen to what other millions of people are listening. And the similar thing is happening in, with the countries. So people want to, not to live where everybody's going. People want to live extraordinary lives in extraordinary places. And that said, just recently, William Swing uh, said, actually in Japan, he was visiting Japan when he said it, one out of seven uh, of the world's seven million population is a migrant. So every, one out of seven person is a migrant. And as he continued, we are living in an era of the greatest human uh, mobility in the recorded history. So people are moving around. There are, according to Teleport, there are 420 million people today ready to relocate for careers. And it's a good news for the world. Just like Time Magazine said, people with more ex experiences of different cultures are able to generate more creative ideas. So what it actually means in a simple language is that Increasing mobility helps to build a more helps to build more creative teams. And let's look at the numbers a little bit. So, where do the highly skilled migrants come from? It, according to World Bank, in 2000, the high, number one source for highly skilled migrants was the UK, whereas 2010. It was India, Philippines, and China. And more, more to it, 90% of all PhDs in the physical sciences and engineering are held by Asians living in Asia. This is really great news. Especially for Japan, because Japan, according to Manpower Group's research, then in 2016, to 86% um, of all employers in Japan reported difficulties filling, in jo filling jobs. And what it means is that they are, Japan is number one in, with that problem in the world. The global average is twice lower. So it means that there's a lot of talent around the neighborhood that could be brought in to fill those jobs. But now in order to fill those jobs, we have to look at the comfort zone and the comfort zone of hiring. I think the big question that we have here is, are we hiring the best people for our companies or the ones that we are most comfortable hiring? And having worked with companies across 44 countries now with Jovatical, one of the big things I hear from all over the world, from, from Costa Rica to Australia, from Estonia to Zambia, we are hiring culture fit. Let's look at that a little bit. We are hiring culture fit. I would look at the organization in a way like a human life. So if you think about your life, let's say you are, imagine yourself being 20 year old and you tell the world that this is who I am. I am ready. I only take just everything that fits me. That's the only thing that I want to see. I don't want any new experiences. I don't want to grow. In a way, if you are, hiring people who are similar to what you already are. That's exactly what you're doing. Versus every person who brings on board a, a difference is what helps the organization to grow. Let's look at Silicon Valley, because we love Silicon Valley. There are so many great companies coming from Silicon Valley. There's no tech conference that doesn't have Silicon Valley representation to talk about how are you doing it there in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, in Silicon Valley, 74% computer science workers in the age group of 25 to 44 are foreign born. It is the diversity that makes 
Silicon Valley, great. And now thinking about that, um, I looked at my own team, our team Chubarical. Um, and today we have 24 people from 11 nationalities, obviously a very diverse team. And I started to analyze how did it actually happen? Besides the fact that I really encourage diversity, it wasn't something that we planned. And I started to analyze what was the actual reason? How did we get there? How did we get just this conversation I had with our CTO and my co-founder just a few weeks ago when I asked him, so where does our newest full stack developer come from? And he said, I don't know, I didn't ask, it doesn't matter. So how did we get to the point where we don't look at the passport? The passport doesn't matter. It only matters what the person brings on board. And I got to the point that one of the big reasons for that is that we have a gatekeeper. We have a very open-minded gatekeeper who joined us from Silicon Valley, who had been previously recruiter for Google, Evernote, and very global companies. And she came in with a very open mind, and she, with her open mind, she funnels us, the people, with their skills, with their experiences, but doesn't look at the passports. So that is something for everybody uh, who are running the companies to think, how to help our gatekeepers to keep an open mind. Because it's not only that diversity is good and makes us more creative, it also brings us more money. Look at the numbers. McKinsey um, has stated that companies in the top quartile for racial and ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to have financial returns above their respective national industry medians. So no wonder if you look at the United States again, over half of the unicorns, over half of the billion dollar companies are founded by the immigrants. So I found a Chubatical very much to enhance diversity in the world, to encourage people to build careers outside their home countries, to see the opportunities, not the comfortable ones located in the neighborhood, but see them globally, find the best team in, on the planet. The same way for, for the teams to find the talent that is best suitable in terms of the skills and the experiences, but not for the passport or not because they are comfortably located, located in the neighborhood. But building a diverse team and just, I mean, it is an important topic, but it's not an easy and not, not all the companies grasp it from day one. And we have a really good case, which, a good case from, from Finland actually, uh, just recently. Um, it ended up with a hire, but the story was following. There was a Finnish company, Platonix, who was lacking certain type of developers locally. So they approached us and they asked our help. But they said, we only want Europeans. We, want, we don't want to look at any other candidates outside Europe. But we encourage them to leave the openness, kind of leave the cards open. You can always choose whoever you choose, but leave the cards open. And at the end of the day, what happened was that the best person, a very specific skill, very difficult to find, the best person for that job they hired from Argentina, which is 10,000 miles from Finland. So I think after this experience, this company will never close their mind again. For them, the globe is the market, not the neighborhood. So if this discussion inspired you to think about building a diverse team. If you have questions, if you need encouragement, want to hear my experience as being the team leader of a very diverse team, feel free to ask me for a coffee. I will be around here, happy to answer all your questions. Thank you very much.